Well, I'm very thankful to be here, and I'm grateful for Jeff inviting me. Um, the connection, actually, was uh, I know Jeremy Livermore through some ministry stuff at UC Irvine. So that's how I got connected here, and here I am. And I have just the small task of defending the resurrection, the most important event in history of all time. So um, good philosophers make very small claims and then spend pages defending a very small claim. So I've, I'm sort of in a bad spot because <laughs> I have a big thing, a big claim to defend. So uh, in that regard, I'm going to uh, do my best to give a really good idea of, of of a method and content that you can use for your own faith and for others to defend the resurrection. And I'll leave the caveat there that uh, hopefully the questions I wasn't able to answer or I didn't offer will be more curiosities for you to go study on your own, more things that you'll research. Okay, so administratively I'm supposed to pass this around, so I guess I'll start right here. That's You, you know you're teaching when you're passing out attendance. Now, I'll just uh, give you a little bit of my background. So I'm a PK, so I'm familiar with being in church. <laughs> and, you know, if I, I've been asked a number of times on applications and at ministry events, and you know, what's your story, you know? And, and I feel like people are waiting for me to say, you know, well, I was in the mafia, and then, you know, I roamed the streets, and then I did a lot of drugs. I don't have any <laughs> dramatic uh, testimony like that. And I used to think that was a problem. And then it occurred to me one day that, you know, that's, that's not a problem. That's, that's a blessing. So the blessing in my life has been that um, I have grown up in a, in a warm family with uh, faith as a core of my existence. In fact, I don't remember exactly... I, didn't have, I don't have like a moment where I say, July 14th, 1987, I was at a youth group meeting and I, you know, said a prayer. I don't have a very specific uh, testimony like that. Yet, uh, it's true in philosophy that uh, if you try to pinpoint an event, it's very hard to do. Like, think about something as simple as walking through that doorway. Um, you were outside and then you were inside, right? But what if you tried to pinpoint the exact moment at which you transferred from being outside to inside? So that's sort of usually how I describe my testimony is I completely acknowledge to the utmost that I was fallen and then because of Christ's redemption, I'm on the right path. <laughs> but it's more like a transition for me because I don't know exactly. There may have been, but I don't know when that is. Anyways, so I, I grew up in a Christian family in the church, pastor's kid, yet uh, I came to some of the same impasses that we all come to when you come of age and you start asking questions for yourself. You're borrowing your parents' faith, and then at some point, you just you just have that moment where you say, "Do I really believe that?" Or somebody poses a question to you, and you say, "Well, um, I've never heard that before. <laughs> I don't know how to answer your question." And then that might even derail your own faith. So in my story, I, I, uh, I wasn't exactly having a crisis of faith, but I was, I did get my undergraduate degree at Biola in intercultural studies. And then I was waiting tables to pay back school loans, which, you know, it's a fine job. But as an undergrad with a degree, I literally was at an intersection. I, I can tell you exactly where the intersection is in La Mirada. And I had just gotten off my shift. I smelled like steak and cheese bread from Sizzler, because that's where I was working. And I was sitting there at a red light. It's one of those red lights where you're sitting there and you're thinking, why is there a rule that I can't go right now? Because there's nobody for miles in any either, either direction. But it was actually poetic, because that was what was happening internally. I was, was saying, 
why am I just paying back loans, doing basically nothing with my life? <laughs> what am I supposed to be doing? And I started flashing back to, well, one instance in particular, actually, was getting in the car when my mom picked me up from junior high and asking her things like, okay, instead of saying, you know, guess what Billy did today? It was like, if God is three and he's one, how does that make any sense? Isn't that incoherent? And my mom was, you know, would give her best answer, but she wasn't thinking along those lines. So I would blast her out of the water with these crazy questions. So I thought about myself being wired that way, and then I went off to Talbot, which is the grad, the seminary at uh, Biola, and studied philosophy and religion. So I figured, all those questions I've been stewing about for a long time, and I didn't know they were philosophy, I can go study those and, and have some decent answers, which I did have, uh, I did gain, and th this is, some of this apologetics is, is, uh, is part of that. Um, so I'll, I'll try to make this briefer. Um, so I, I worked for a number of years actually on homes because I paid cash for my seminary because I didn't want to take out any more loans. And it started to be successful. So I ended up raising a family and, and working in that field for a while. And then I got passionate again about philosophy and apologetics and the faith and theology. And through a series of events, I'm now a full-time missionary at UC Irvine. And basically what we do is we equip students with this same sort of material. So when they have their own crisis of faith, or you know, with, they're asking those questions for the first time. It's like a, a buffet of ideas when you go off to school. And uh, so we're there to sort of equip them and engage questioners on campus as well. So, and, and then in addition to that, I, I get the opportunity to, you know, teach some classes on the side and do things like this. And honestly, uh, if you come and find me on a Saturday night when other people are at the movies or having fun or at the restaurant, I'll be behind the computer or I'll be at a discussion group talking about, you know, infralapsarianism or something. So, um, if you like that sort of thing, we're in good company together. Okay, sorry, I have a lot of things going here. Okay, so we're not going to spend the whole class talking about apologetics. We're going to do apologetics by talking about the content. But I do want to sort of introduce apologetics and the resurrection as it applies to that. So we sort of have a, a foundation of what we're doing. And just, just a couple brief words about the idea of doing three weeks of this. Um, like I said, I want to cover the basics. I want to give you uh, a way of talking about the resurrection that will help you not only have faith yourself, but when you engage people who aren't already in the church, they're coming from a different perspective. So this is a method. It's called the minimal facts approach. We'll get to that, but it's something that, that you should be able to use as a methodology and you'll cover a lot of the content that you would normally cover anyways about the resurrection. But it is a rabbit hole, just like any of these topics, uh, whether we were talking about evil or sin or redemption or the resurrection. There's no way we can cover everything. So I hope that your appetite will be whetted by what we go through, and you'll, you'll want to study more. And uh, I'll show you some resources on that. In fact, I have a slide that'll show you some books, but there are other resources. Maybe I'll, if if I can do this by maybe the, the last session, I'll, I'll give you sort of a bibliography of some things you might want to pursue based on whether you want to do something real basic that's very approachable, like Lee Strobel, or something really in depth, like 700 pages of Mike Lacona. So, um, in in fact, oh, sorry, wrong computer. Um, here are some books. So a couple of the core ones I'm engaged with right now are especially those first two, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Habermas and Lacona. And Habermas is sort of the name in the field. Uh, he has done the most extensive research on the resurrection and contemporary scholarship. 
And Reasonable Faith, the second book, is by William Lane Craig, uh, who, if you're not familiar with him, he debates atheists worldwide. He's well known for that. He has a double doctorate. He He's one of the foremost evangelical minds in apologetics and philosophy. And there are some others there, N.T. Wright, Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace, which is a great book, actually, as an entry level for just apologetics in general concerning the New Testament. Um, he's a cold case detective. He's still active as a cold case detective. Oh, yeah. And he basically was an atheist, or a skeptic at least, if not an atheist. And he that one, uh, he basically brought his expertise of years of cold case detectives uh, solving cold cases, and he brought that expertise to his question about Christianity. Like he actually started to, li- to, to honestly question it. And when he used those tools, and went through it exhaustively, he became a believer based on his investigation using his detective skills. So I'll reference that a little bit. Very, He's very winsome, too. Uh, if you ever have a chance to just look him up on YouTube or, or his writing's the same, he's very easy to get along with, to listen to. And that that slide was added after they printed, so I can uh, maybe post that somewhere that you guys can access. Okay, so let's lay some groundwork. What is apologetics? I've never used the pointer before, so. Um, yes, we're talking about the resurrection specifically, but um, there are a lot of ground ground rules that will help us see the importance of it. So, uh, if you're here, you may have already gone through this material with other people teaching on apologetics, but I find that I dislike the word apologetics a lot, <laughs> because especially for the uninitiated, it's such a weird concept apologizing and people get confused and it's a uh, a lot of syllables (laughs) so I prefer you know any of these other other terms are preferable as far as I'm concerned especially if you're talking to somebody whether it's Christian or non-Christian that just hasn't heard that term and that you're looking to engage them and get somewhere with them relationally that word isn't going to help you. So you, you could say, uh, if they're asking you about a book you're reading, and you, instead of saying, oh, it's a book on apologetics, you could say, oh, I'm reading about defending the faith or you know, defending the Christian faith or making a case, giving an account, giving a rational justification. That's a little more technical. Um, or removing doubts. So let's talk about these. So... Any any apologetics book, you will open it up and they'll tell you. Uh, apologetics comes from the Greek root apologia, which is Greek for defense. That's literally what it means. So the easiest way to picture it is, you know, Paul was in trouble a few times in <laughs> with the court. So if you look up, it's the same concept, that same term, apologia, is what's used when he's defending himself before the leaders. So... That's just a real simple picture if somebody wants to know what apologetics is. It's the same as making a defense in a court case, really. Um, If you want to look up that reference, you can look up 2 Timothy 4.16 about Paul giving a legal defense. And literally, apologia means make a verbal case in defense of one's position to make a verbal case in defense of one's position. So it really should be making a verbal case in defense of one's position ethics, (laughs) rather than apologetics. But that doesn't roll off the tongue. What about giving a rational justification? 
um, that's sort of a more philosophical way of saying it, and there's some philosophical baggage there. When we talk about what is knowledge, this is a whole branch of philosophy, epistemology. Episte meaning knowledge and ology, study of knowledge. So what is it? How do we know when we have it? And the classic, the classic uh, formula for knowledge is uh, justifi a justified true belief. So you have three factors, justification, truth, and belief. So philosophically speaking, we're presenting reasons that give epistemic justification for the Christian worldview. And let me just say that in plain language. That means explaining our beliefs in such a way that they're both, not only are they true, they're also justified. So you didn't just get bonked on the head and you suddenly thought that and you got lucky. You have to have a justification also for how you came to have that belief. And if you have those three belief, if you have a belief that's true and it's justified, then you have knowledge. And that's kind of you know technical sounding, but that's really what we want, right? If you're trying to convince somebody of something, you need those three. So that's what we're engaged in, is, is causing other people to see the same. Now, this idea of removing doubts is a little bit new to me. I actually read a book by Dallas Willard called The Allure of Gentleness, which basically is, uh, Dallas Willard was a professor at USC. If you've ever heard of J.P. Moreland or Doug Guyvett or Greg Tanalsoff, those are all sort of people that studied under Dallas Willard at USC, and he's a prominent USC professor. He's now passed away, but he would defend the faith privately and publicly, but he still had people's ear. Like, he had the respect of the people that he engaged, even though he was outright Christian. And so this, I, this the idea of this book, Allure of Gentleness, is, is sort of a, uh, a balance to the apologetics world where people are out there having sort of a, uh, an offensive, uh, well, they're meaning to be offensive, like, like in a, you know, a sports game, you're on offense, uh, but they're being offensive <laughs> because they're not being gentle, they're not being gracious. And he's sort of balancing that out. And he, he really brings, brings it to, he really takes it to heart and, and exhorts us to, this is how he says it. He says, apologetics is the task of aiding others in removing doubts that hinder their enthusiastic and full participation in the kingdom of the heavens and their discipleship to Christ. That's a lot more robust, real life, real... Uh, it just has a lot more... Uh, uh, what's the word? It's more compelling. It's it's not just an academic exercise. It's really trying to get people connected to Christ. I'm sorry? That is Dallas Willard. D-A-L-L-A-S. First name, last name, Willard. W-I-L-L-A-R-D. And the book was Allure of Gentleness. And I'll say, I'll have another point about that in a second. No, it's okay. Uh, in fact, I should, let me pause for a second, and I'm sort of going through the presentation here and lecturing, as it were. But um, when I have other groups, especially discussion groups, I, I, especially when new people come, I, I say, okay, we got to set some ground rules. Well, ground rule. There's one rule, and the rule is you have to interrupt me. So, uh, <laughs> yes, so um, I'll just, you know, duck my head and run if nobody says anything, but I invite interaction and discussion as we go on, so that was a good icebreaker for that. Thank you. So why think so hard? Uh, in fact, the number one, especially in church, I'd say in culture as a whole, but especially in church, the thing I, the, the wall that I butt my head against up, but my, I, I butt my head up against <laughs> is when I say defense of the faith and people think, or they, they'll, they'll tell me, well, I just believe we just need to share the gospel and just love people. 
and I say, I want to share the gospel and love people too. But I also <laughs> want to defend the faith rationally for people that are going through rational doubts. So one aspect of thinking hard is having something to say when we're evangelizing. Now let me unpack some ideas here about evangelism. So anybody know the the Greek word for evangelism or the or not for evangelism but for for the gospel or the good news? Anybody know that? Greek? It's okay, I had to look it up myself. It's it's if I'm I'm not a Greek scholar, so I hope if there's somebody that is, you're gonna have to correct my pronunciation, but I believe it's Euangelion, or Euangelion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, so y even if you don't speak Greek, you can see the connection, right? It sounds very similar, and there's a reason, because when we're evangelizing, we're telling the good news, coming from the same root, and what is the good news? Well, let's boil it down. There's a lot of doctrines we can talk about, a lot of aspects to Christianity, a lot of things people are going to have to learn once they start to believe. But they don't have to know all that. There's a core to the initial gospel, the, the fundamentals. The deity, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. So if you want to boil down the good news, as far as elements go, you would have the deity, the death, and the resurrection. And if you want to think in terms of chronology or life events, the deity would be sort of like the birth and incarnation wrapped up in one. Um, as, I mean, if you're thinking of it as in this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But I say deity because that's sort of the conceptual thing that you need, right? You need, you need, you need him not only to die and resurrect, but you also need him to be God for other theological... He, you need deity for him to, to be able to redeem us correctly or sufficiently, which is a separate issue. Now, of course, there's a tremendous spiritual reality I mean, behind all of this. I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm adding to the picture. I'm not negating any of the spiritual reality or, or the spiritual points. What I am saying is that the physical nature of the events and the impact of something transcendent smacking right into our physical world and connecting with us for redemption is 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 a point of connection that can be used when we're giving evidence. Okay, we're not just saying something spiritual happened. We're also saying some, that that it played out in physical reality. So let me give you another quote. Now this is from F. F. Bruce. He has a book called "The New Testament Documents: Are They Reliable?" and he's talking about the reliability of Scripture in general. But he makes a striking point about what I'm saying. He says, Christianity as a way of life depends upon the acceptance of Christianity as good news. And this good news is intimately bound up with the historical order, for it tells how for the world's redemption, God entered into history. The eternal came into time. The kingdom of heaven invaded the realm of earth. In the great events of the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, so here's my point. Being able to give a well-studied defense of the resurrection on these historical and evidential grounds, that's good evangelism. Because we're giving, we're giving good news not of just something that's, that's ethereal to hope for, but of a physical thing that actually interacted with where we are. <laughs> that's the imminence of the gospel, right? So that's the good news. And as I've written here, uh, in evangelism, this method of defending the resurrection apologetically or evidentially is one method. Okay, so again, it's I'm adding to the picture. You have the Holy Spirit as the fundamental reality of how people are regenerated, right? We can't get there without the Holy Spirit. That's always going to be the core spiritual reality. Yet, if you were to go survey a bunch of different people from different uh, walks of life, different stories of their testimony, you're going to have a mix. You're going to have people who, some businessmen who had somebody do service evangelism and came and cleaned their toilets 
and that got him interested in finding out what was, what was up with that person. Or you may have somebody who's very rational, like Jay Warner Wallace, I mentioned. All right, it's not up there, but uh, he was very cerebral, right? He didn't, he, he, that, that didn't strike him that somebody would love him in a certain way. He had enough love in his life. He had a decent life as far as relationships go. He had fundamental rational questions, okay? So even if it's the rational method, the Holy Spirit is still active and is still the fundamental spiritual reality that's happening behind the scenes. Yet, for somebody like J. Warden Wallace, he's going to need to do the research, the investigation, have somebody give him some solid points rationally. Another example is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, there's there's a lot there's a lot to say there. But one thing I would say is, yeah. What I would do is I would drive a wedge. So this is the issue of pluralism versus Christian exclusivism. To give you some isms, I paid like good money for those isms in my tuition. Um, so. It, ha, have you ever heard, sometimes people illustrate that by saying, well, you know, you may have one person that's standing by the leg of the elephant and says, well, the elephant is a long thing with a knee and toes. And then another person is looking at the shoulder and saying, no, it's just sort of a canvas-looking, gray, wrinkly skin. But they're all, you know, and you keep giving different angles, oh, but they're all seeing the same elephant. They just have different perspectives. Well, the problem is that Christianity is saying, this is what the whole elephant looks like. It's, it's giving an exhaustive, exclusive claim about the most important thing. So it's saying, it's saying this is the only way it can be. It's exclusive. So, so I, what I would do is, if I was talking to that person, I would draw out things that drive a wedge, like statements like, um, like I and the Father are one, or I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There, there's a wealth of, of things that Jesus said that are so bold. Um, and then this is actually a point as part of this and, and just as part of Christ's self-understanding. He said and did things that were undeniably... Uh, he claimed a relationship with the Father that nobody else has claimed in the same way and backed it up with historical evidence. So you have to drive a wedge between Christianity and all other religions because they don't make those same exclusive claims. You may have some, ex- uh, some of them don't make any exclusive claims, and some that do don't have the same footing that Christianity has, which is part of what our task is here tonight or, or during these weeks is to show um, the exemplary nature of Christianity versus other religions. I'll, I'll get your question in just a second. Um, Habermas, one of the authors I mentioned, who I'm relying on a lot, has has described this from his own... I mean, he, he was a skeptic as well and then came to faith. And basically, when he looked at all the different religions, he couldn't believe how well-attested Christianity was compared to other religions. Like, if you think of apologetics, there aren't a lot of apologetics happening outside of Christianity. For partially because of the nature of other religions, and partially because they don't have anything tangible to offer. We're, we're, what we're doing now, this, this defense of the res- sorry, resurrection, is based on very solid, historical, tangible events. Like I was saying, that idea of, of that interface with, from the spiritual to the physical in recorded historical events. So along those sorts of lines, I would drive that wedge to show if Christianity is true, then the other ones are false. And at, at the least, you can't say that Christianity is lumped with the others because it's making exclusive claims. It either stands or falls with the resurrection. Go ahead. Right. 
Right. Yeah, that's simple. Mm -hmm. Right. This, you know, it's interesting, and I, I didn't study this too in depth at, when it came up, but there was the issue with the professor uh, who basically defended them uh, and is a uh, Muslim based on the idea that, well, we're, we're, we really worship the same God, we just have different understandings. And um, the problem is that you can't have Two, doc, two, two sets of doctrines that make claims about the nature of anything. <laughs> and they have different statements in there that conflict. So, I mean, if, if we have 10 things that we agree on, but there are 10 things we don't agree on about the nature of the red ball in the other room, then we're not necessarily talking about the same thing. So somebody's got to be wrong. <laughs> People don't want to be wrong, but we can't. I mean, somebody's got to be wrong if you have conflicting claims, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's one of the main impasses. And Nabil Nabil Qureshi, is that the right pronunciation? I listened to a talk at a conference that he gave about showing the superiority of of the Christian concept based on the Trinity, because without the Trinity, you can't have an all loving God in the same way. So that's a separate issue. I won't get into. Okay, so another reason to think hard is because it strengthens our faith. Uh, I mean, that's my own journey I already mentioned. You know, I had questions, and I came out of the process of asking those questions with answers. I had more questions, too. <laughs> Any good philosophy course will give you more questions than you started with, but it'll also answer some. <laughs> but there's, al I mean, there's always some mystery to, to things, but this is the way I've written it, and... <clears throat> At first I wrote this and I thought, wow, that's really bad grammar. And then I left it because it really illustrates the point. True truth withstands scrutiny. I know that's redundant, true truth. But um, I think sometimes Christians have a habit of having this sort of spiritually rea spiritual reality they're entertaining that's, that's true. But if it meets up with the real world, as it were, then... They, they, they just have, sort of leave it as a leap of faith and they don't have an intersection between the spiritual things they believe and the physical things they believe. So I think it's a natural and appropriate thing for us to doubt. And I don't, uh, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> and my experience has been that with, uh, with the, in conjunction with our relationship with God, I'm not saying throw that out completely, that's a necessary aspect as well. But if you have all those ingredients together, when you come up against these questions, um, then the truth will bear itself out. And you're actually, um, when you have environments where doubt is frowned upon, then you're actually denying people the possibility of strengthening their faith and sort of making it into a legitimate faith in evidence combined with their spiritual experience rather than just a blind leap of faith. And sometimes, yeah, those are some of the, some of the uh, environments that, um, this is one thing that I mention to people when I tell them about the ministry we're doing at UCI, is people come from an environment where doubt is, doubt is frowned upon or, or there just are insufficient answers or answers that don't really apply to the questions. Like if I ask you, well, can you tell me a little bit about the tangible evidence for the resurrection? And, and you say, well, you know, when we believe in the resurrection, we have faith. And I'm, well, okay, I understand. But what I'm asking you is, and you know, if there's that impasse, we're not really helping believers. Yes. 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 Um, that's all. Um, I 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me illustrate for a second. Um, again, to, to borrow this from Habermas, he talks about if you're a Christian and you're a doctor, what do you do? You study biology, you study biochemistry, you go to medical school, you use the knowledge we have of medicine, qua medicine, to treat people with medicine. You don't, you're not a witch doctor just because of your faith. That doesn't mean you don't pray for people. You don't, there there's, could also be a spiritual reality in play. But as a, as, as a medical practitioner, you study medicine. As a, as a, um, as an athlete, you train. As a historian, you use the historical method. There's a reason why it works, because it's true, and it tells us about reality. It's just that, like any discipline. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow uh, the method of historians and use the appropriate historical methods. So, so even if, if you know nothing about the resurrection and I start to unfold some historical events that are recorded, I'm going to talk about things like, okay, the 500 witnesses. Let's talk about the credibility of that account. Let's talk about um, the timing of that account, other factors. So those, yeah, th those are exactly the kind of things Artifacts. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all part of the package. Um, specifically with the resurrection, something like that will play in when you say, um, Something like, how could a miracle happen at all? We live in a natural world, miracles don't happen. And one of the ways of talking about that is to say, we're not just saying that just a miracle just happened all of a sudden. We're saying, given a certain recorded history of things that are reputable, we see the, uh, the expectation of a Messiah, and we see Jesus' claims that, that seemed to portray himself as divine and united with the Father. And then we see his death and resurrection as a vindication of those claims. So given, it's a lot different to talk about a miracle in a vacuum versus something like that scenario I just laid out. And part of that scenario is things like you're just mentioning. Like uh, general arguments for God's existence will play in as supporting background information. So any any time you weigh evidence, it's it's not just in a vacuum. You you also have background information you're weighing it against. And one of those things will be, does God exist, or is there evidence for God's existence in general? Because if part of your story is God exists, He creates. There's a story unfolding of redemption. There's the resurrection. You the, it, you pull the rug out from under that if you don't have arguments for God's existence. I'm not talking about our own personal faith. I'm talking about on an evidential basis when we're making that argument. So all that will come into play. Okay, let me blast through this. <clears throat> Shaping culture. Now, I want to say that we tend to think of, of, you know, coming to a class like this or thinking about this or talking to our friends about this as sort of a very small thing sometimes. But what we're all engaged in from the PhDs down to kids Sunday school is shaping culture. So if you haven't noticed, our culture is 
post-Christian. Uh, there may be pockets where we're insulated from that, but as a whole, we're not becoming increasingly open to Christianity. And isn't it odd that, well, Greg Kokel, uh, an apologist, was talking about one of the clues to something that our spiritual enemy is doing is when something obviously ridiculous and non-commonsensical becomes commonsensical to people. Like, for instance, there's Islamic extremists that take down the two towers, and now if you say anything bad about Islam, you're an Islamophobe. But it's cool to be a Christianophobe. So what gives? Anyways, that's a side point. Um, so in this culture, uh, we, uh, I'm not trying to heap pressure on it, but I, I want to make some, to give some poignancy to the task it, it, that we, as we engage people and we, we choose when, when that sort of divine appointment comes up and you're thinking, I don't really want to talk to this person, that you're engaged in an effort collectively with the whole body to help shape culture. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, Dr. William Lane Craig says it this way, to, to make Christianity an intellectually viable option. Okay? So we were just talking about, does God exist, right? So if you're convinced that all that there is is the natural world, and I start talking to you about Jesus Christ, and he incarnated, and, and he redeemed us for our sins, and all this crazy stuff, um, I believe it's true, but it is crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild. I mean, it's not crazy insane, but it's, it's wild stuff to talk about, right? Um, what I'm going to need to do is give you the permission to believe that stuff by talking about, well, let me explain to you why there can't only be the natural, or let me explain to you why I think God exists with some, some basic arguments like, like um, here's, a, here's a basic syllogism. All things that begin to exist have a cause, right? Have you ever seen anything that began to exist without a cause? <laughs> that doesn't happen. Second step, the universe began to exist. All you have to do is read up on the Big Bang Theory, and that's pretty straightforward. So what's the inevitable conclusion? There must be a cause to the universe. And you start questioning, well, what would that cause look like? You, you end up with what we call God. So uh, let me read. Uh, this is a quote from Gresham Machen. He was a Princeton theologian in the 20s and 30s. This is Princeton on the verge of this whole collapse into liberalism of the Ivy League schools. So, I mean, if you go to the schools, you'll see the nice, you know, the pretty inlay of stone that says things like faith, fidelity. Um, I can't remember exactly all the words, but they'll have terms like that, faith, fidelity, virtue, all these, you know, Judeo-Christian terms, right? And now uh, they just sort of ignore them, I guess, because they're ultra-liberal theologically. So on the eve of all this movement towards that liberalism, he says, false ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there. If we permit the whole collective thought of the nation to be controlled by ideas which prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. So imagine how hard it already is to sort of put ourselves out there in the, in, in the, in the marketplace of ideas, right? And the, the more we let culture go as a whole and stop interacting with people, it's going to be even harder to share the gospel because people just aren't going to see that worldview. Um, he also said, what is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. In that second stage, it has gone too far to be combated. The time to stop it was when it was still a matter of impassionate debate. So as Christians, we should try to mold the thought of the world in such a way as to make the acceptance of Christianity something more than a logical absurdity. And he's saying this a hundred years ago. And look where we are now. So it's even more poignant now. Okay, and now let's move on to the last column so we have time to do more stuff. 
So if you've ever heard anybody explain apologetics as, as what it says in 1 Peter 3.15, be ready to give a defense of the faith that you have with gentleness and reverence. Okay, That's sort of the, the motto of the apologetics movement. And I have no problem with that. I think that's an accurate use of it. Um, so be ready. So you got to know. That means you got to know something and be ready to say something, right? Uh, you need to be gracious. So when it says with gentleness and reverence, you know, uh, sometimes being a, giving that defense of the faith sounds sort of combative, but we're not doing something combative. We're actually helping remove doubts and graciously trying to lead people to Christ, even though we're doing it in a rational way. Now, there's sort of a third element <clears throat> that I think uh, is is lost a lot of times. Now, I'll mention Greg Kokel again. His ministry is called Stand to Reason. If you ever want to look him up, he's very approachable as well. Now, he says, he has this little little funny line. He says, never read a Bible verse. You guys ever heard that? So, at first it throws you off. You're like, what are you, what are you talking about? I thought you were a Christian. And the point is, never read a Bible verse by itself, okay? So way too often people have an idea, like you'll have a spiritual idea. Oh, that's, that sounds good. And then you'll go look up in the Bible. Oh, there's a verse that says that. Like that's backwards. What you do is you look at a verse, and if, you, if you're not quite sure what to do with it, you look at the context. So the context of First Peter 3 is Christians. This is the beginning of Christianity. Christians suffering and being persecuted and yet having joy in their sufferings. So what happens when people see that from these Christians? Well, they've got questions. They've, these people are so compelling amidst their circumstances that, that the onlookers are going, what gives? <laughs> what's with, are, you guys, are you guys crazy or you know what's going on? So that is, that, that is the environment in which we're supposed to be ready. It's not just be ready like, okay, let's all get a game plan and go out there and find them. I, that is part of it, because it does say go make disciples. But there's another aspect represented here where it's, are you living as a disciple of Jesus in such a way that not only you have the content, but your life is an apologetic in such a way that people are uh, not only... So, so if you're living that way and they're drawn to you, you want to... You want that, but you also have to have something to say. So it's the both of them, right? You, you've got to live in such a way that's compelling. Because if you're saying, you should believe what I believe, because I think it's true, and then they don't see any impact on your life, what are you inviting them into? <laughs> it's like inviting somebody to a party, and they look inside, and there's nothing going on. And why are they going to come to the party? So we have a combination of be well-prepared intellectually, be gracious in your interaction and living as a genuine disciple of Jesus in such a way that people can't help but wonder what's up with us. All right. We finally made it out of that slide. I'm going to race through this one because I am. Because there's some foundational stuff we want to get to before the night gets away from us. In fact, I think we will do, let's blast through this one, and then we'll take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about some stuff more directly, talking about our case for the resurrection. So this should be printed out for you. And... It's not in there. I wonder if I is it? Oh, it's at the bottom of the same page. Okay. I just work here. <laughs> okay, so what is the impact of of the resurrection or the importance of the resurrection in particular? Well, like I said at the beginning, it's only the most important event in history. No big deal, right? Um, so spiritually speaking, it, it, it's, it's what secures our destiny. So Romans talks about uh, basically Jesus being the forerunner of our own immortality, our own resurrection, right? 
So this isn't just some cosmic thing that happened only to him. It's something that he is going before us to do as well. I mean, it's, it's the way that we're linked in to the eternal plan of redemption is gaining immortality through his defeat of death and his resurrection. First uh, Peter 1, 3 through 4 says that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So it, it secures our destiny as believers, and that's the substance of our hope. Oops. Now, remember I talked about the, the core things of the good news, right? The, the birth, death, and resurrection, or deity, death, and resurrection. Well, let's call it birth to make my point <laughs> correctly, because we can't identify with being divine, but we can identify with being born, and we can identify easily with dying. Those are we're very familiar with those uh, uh, on the whole as people. But has anybody had any interaction with being raised from the dead? <laughs> I don't think so. So it's oh no, but I mean, I mean in this room. I mean, have you? <laughs> I mean, we, it's a little easier to identify with the first two. Um, but that third element, we're drawn into identification with that through Christ. So it's sort of the, in, in a lot of ways, it's the missing piece of the good news that we can identify with. And it, it, it is directly mentioned as the object of our faith. So... Romans 10.9 says that the content of our confession and belief that leads to salvation is the resurrection. I mean, it just directly says that. And 1 Corinthians 15.17-18 illustrates that without the resurrection, there's no remedy for our sin and the accompanying separation from our Creator. There's what it says. For This is one of the main verses that shows the consequence of the resurrection. For if the dead are not raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, we have no hope of resurrection ourselves if Christ was not in fact raised from the dead. Now, this point of it producing faith, hope, and perseverance is almost a given based on what we just said. It's pretty easy to see that based on... Uh, um, I mean, if what we just read doesn't give you hope, then I don't know what would... Uh, and... We read first Peter, or we talked about First Peter one three. It calls it a living hope. I mean, it's not just some pie in the sky. It's it's a living, breathing hope that we actually survive on. And of all the things that could strengthen believers, faith, as I mentioned earlier, it's an undeniable historical, physical resurrection. That's at the top of the list of things that I could think of that could possibly strengthen my faith. I mean, what? How much more direct can you? come into contact with something that produces faith in you than to literally find out that Jesus historically raised from the dead versus other religions where it's just ethereal. Um, John 20. This is the story of Tom, Jesus appearing to Thomas. Okay, so the, here, here's the scene, right? He's already appeared to some of the others, but Thomas, I think, I, I can't remember if it said a week or ten days earlier. I'll have to look that up. He's with them, right? And they're saying, we, we saw him. He was here. We touched him. And he says, you guys are crazy. I, I won't believe it unless I see it myself. So 10 days later, uh, they're, they're assembled together again, and he shows up, Jesus. But all the doors are closed. There's no openings, and he just appears. It doesn't say how he appears. He, I don't know if he, if, he, if he translated himself through the roof or the walls, or if he just Appeared. But you're Thomas, right? You're already doubting, and you're in that mood. You're probably going to be like, all right, now I really am crazy. I'm seeing something, or it's a ghost. So what finally happens, He, he Jesus says, all right, let's do this. you, you got to figure this out for yourself. He touches him. That's that intersection, again, between heaven and earth. He touches him. So... I think about that story a lot because, oh, you know, later he says, blessed are those who, who don't see and believe. 
and we're sort of in that boat. We have the evidence, and we have enough to trust, to have faith in, actual evidence. But we're kind of like Thomas, and once we, we're walking down that road, and then, like, put yourself in the shoes of, of a skeptic who, who isn't already inside Christianity, and they're asking about this. You want to bring them to that same impasse where they're like, all right, got to find out if this is true or not. And then when they touch their version and our version of Thomas's experience is touching the evidence. So we're brought to that same impasse, and then we say, we either go back into even more rebellion spiritually, because we're already in that, right, before we're regenerate, or we cross that line and we say, my Lord and my God, just like Thomas said. Okay, I'm going to move on to the evidential. So those are some spiritual points. There's more that could be said there, but... Now, evidentially, uh, the important the importance of the resurrection, I, I sort of mentioned this before, the vindication of Jesus' claims. So let me just throw out a few. He says in, in John 2 and elsewhere, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Now, it seems sort of tame, like, well, he's just saying some crazy thing. But the Jewish leadership would have understood that directly as as a uh, the, there's a later passage I'm, I'm trying to just give you the basic idea without getting neck deep into this so we can keep going uh, but basically there's another passage that reflects that they understood when he said that they understood that he was referring to himself and a messianic claim um, there are explicit death and resurrection predictions he makes in Matthew 16, 21. Do I have these references on there? I guess not. Well, let me give you some... Uh, if you guys want to write down these references, I'll mention them real quick. And it can be a, your own little Bible study on... on um, Jesus claims um, he talks about destroying the temple in John 2, 18-22 uh, he talks about the sign of Jonah uh, referring to Jonah as a type of his own experience of being buried and then raising after three days uh, that's Matthew 12, 38-40 He makes explicit claims or predictions in Matthew 16, 21. And for brevity, I won't I have a whole bunch of references there, but any, you know, any study tool you use will give you cross references on those. Uh, Matthew 16, 21. You should probably write down also Mark 8, 31 through 32 as a cross reference. And then you can make a whole case. I mean, this is a whole separate class session, essentially, that we're not going to do, probably. But, I mean, you can basically just make a whole case for Jesus' self-understanding as divine. So things like when he uses Christological titles like Son of God, Messiah, and Son of Man, especially Son of Man, referring back to the Ezekiel prophecy. Um, and there's implicit stuff that happens like, like uh, his behavior and his teaching. So, for instance... When he says, Moses says, but I say. Uh, the classic thing to do as a rabbi at the time would be to, to depend on the authority of other rabbis or other teachers or Moses or other prophets. So you're always sort of putting off the, the burden of proof on and the authority on other people. But he just goes right above all that and says, okay, here's what I'm saying. I'm the authority on this. And he's talking about the law, and things like that. So why am I bringing all this up? Well, you have a scenario, again, where you have the need for redemption. You have the, the Messiah coming at some point. 
And then you have Jesus saying things like, I and the Father are one, and then casting demons out of people and determining people's eternal destiny and claiming authority over Moses and all these things that build him up as that first element, deity, and then he dies, and then he's resurrected. So it's like a vindication of his claims of being the one. And all that is going to be cashed out with historical evidence. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a reference. I have a reference for that. Let's let's talk about that after. We'll hash that up. Um, okay, evidential tiebreaker between worldviews. Um, let me just let me just tell an anecdote, just just to illustrate the point, and then we'll leave it at that. So, um, I have a lot of fun when Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons come visit, um, and a lot of them don't come back. Uh, well, they come back more now because I'm a little more gracious than I used to be because I read that book. <laughs> but I remember the Jehovah's Witnesses coming. There was two ladies. They were nice. Uh, and the classic scenario is you have sort of the trainee and the trainer, whether uh, for all those groups. And so it was real cordial, and we were just talking about things. And I said, oh, yeah, I, I'm interested in what you're talking about because I'm actually teaching some of this stuff. And... We got into it, and it came to a point at which I, I said, uh, I said, now you're going to have to help me because, you know, just last week the Mormons came, and um, I just asked you, you know, sort of what, how, how you know what you're doing is true, and you told me about you experience it, and you feel something profound when you're out there witnessing, which, you know, I believe you, and, and that that's sounds positive. But I also just had the Mormons come and tell me that if if I pray and I feel a certain way, then that would also be confirmation of what they're saying is true, and it's not the same thing that you're saying. And there are other groups that are telling me the same thing, that I need to have some experience something, and that'll be proof. And so I said, well, you know, what's, how am I going to break this tie? <laughs> I've shared this with Mormons, too, when I go through their however many sessions they have. And then they don't know what to do anymore because they've run out of things to say. But uh, there's just, I have yet to hear a decent answer to that question when I interact with them. And the point is, this is, gets back to what I was saying about the uniqueness of Christianity, is that we're talking about something that has historical cred. You know, there are other holy books that have historical elements, but they don't have anything to back them up. They're just sort of assertions. In fact, like if you look at the Quran, we could get into a whole thing about problems with the Quran versus the Bible. So what we want to be able to offer people is a tiebreaker, evidentially. Okay, So anybody can have a subjective experience, a religious experience, or think they are. It might just... Um, Habermas has a, talks about somebody asking him, well, was that God or was that bad barbecue. <laughs> I mean, it could be you slept wrong. Uh, that's I'm not denying spiritual realities. I'm just saying, at the end of the day, what do we have as a tiebreaker between competing truth claims? And what we have is historical evidence and a good case to make. And lastly, confirmation of Scripture in general. Then we'll take a break. Um, and this will lead right into what we're going to get into. So, this idea of minimal facts is to say, what are all the potential facts about the resurrection from the, from the texts or artifacts or whatever evidence we have? And out of those, what are the real solid ones as our core? Um, now, one way of going about that would be to say, well, let's pretend this is the Bible. I could say, I'll prove to you this whole thing is true, and then whatever I tell you out of here, then you'll have to accept that would be an outside-in sort of way of doing it. What we're doing is sort of an inside-out. So we're saying, um, let's say I bring a piece of evidence and I say, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a traditional creed that is well attested by scholars that it was delivered to Paul 
from the core leaders of the church early on, right after the resurrection. So we may not know positively because we weren't standing there seeing the resurrected Jesus, but we do know that they legitimately thought they saw him. Man it passes all the historical tests. So let's say that I we go through our case and we do all that work, right? And we do it inside out. We take some key claims. We're not even claiming inerrancy. We're not claiming any big things. Yes, we believe that, but we're not using that as our method. We're doing inside out. So, we, so what the 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 consequence is? You take a, somebody skeptical. You walk them through those pieces of evidence. They go, "Wow, that's hard to deny." They come to grips with Jesus, and then the floodgates open for the rest of Scripture. So it can actually be an inside-out way of getting somebody to understand that the Bible is an error. So I'm not against proving inerrancy in and of itself. That's just another method. So, um, but this is going to be especially useful for somebody who doesn't want to give that ground. You, you, they, you're starting with things that they're they're gonna, the the skeptical scholars that they follow are gonna admit, and they can't go anywhere but follow the evidence where it lies or where it leads. All right, so let's take a break. Uh, how long of a break do you usually take? Five, ten minutes? Okay. Five or ten. And we'll get into some criteria. Okay, so I don't think I mentioned that I have a wife and three daughters. So if you're talking to me and I go, uh-huh, 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 or I pat you on the head. It's just a force of habit. In fact, I treat my wife that way, unfortunately, out of habit. Like if, she is, but, uh, yeah. Uh, if I'm being encouraging or something, uh, great job, great job. You did a, well, on the shoulder or something. I stop myself from, yeah, I don't. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about some, some real basics, uh, just some motivations about defending the faith in general and, and the resurrection. Now let's, let's get directly into some, some principles for making the case, uh, the structure of our argument and the principles we're using. Okay, again, you should have this. Looks like, did everything print out okay? Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do is make an inference. I'm sorry, hold on. Okay, what we're engaged in here, if we want to talk in argumentation or, or logic, I don't mean argumentation like, you're a jerk, and I don't believe what you have to say. I mean, arguing like making a defense, making a case. Uh, what we're doing is we're making an inference to the best explanation, and we'll unpack that idea in a second. It is what does it sound just what it sounds like. But what we're doing is we're in, making an inference to the resurrection as the best explanation of the facts. So broadly speaking, what we're doing is we're saying the facts. What are they? And then the explanation, what, what's the best explanation of those facts? And that's not too, not too difficult, not too uh, complicated. In fact, we do that all the time with things that matter and don't matter. <laughs> so let's, let's sort of uh, unfold the steps here. So if we want to know what the facts are, we're going to look at the evidence. So... For us, mainly, it's what do the records report? What does the text say? What do, what do the historical documents say? Now, there could be artifacts as well, the corroborating evidence like that. Um, but mainly, what we're dealing with in this uh, type of argument is going to be the text itself. Okay, so, so we take those bits of evidence. You can have evidence without knowing whether it's good or bad, right? He, or whether it applies or not. You just have ev raw evidence. So we need to decipher whether we can use it or not. So we ask, is it reliable? So 
we have certain accounts and we say, are these acceptable? Do these hold water historically? And we're going to talk about how we decipher that. And that is the criteria. So we, there, like I said, if you're, whether you're a Christian or a skeptic or anybody, you can still be a good historian if you do history well in the tried and true methods of historical research. That shouldn't be hard to understand, actually, right? Because uh, the classic example is Alexander the Great. Everybody watches History Channel and the special on Alexander the Great, and we know this about him, we know that about him, and, and uh, this is sort of a side point, but <clears throat> that same sort of credibility we lend to these other antiqu antiquities, these other ancient sources, for some reason, there's a mood change when people get to the scripture. Now, scripture... That's right. And, and that's where the peculiarity comes in. So, I mean, you, you can't associate the resurrection of Jesus with Alexander the Great. That's a great book you have. In, that's one of the books that I don't have with me. It's a great book. N.T. Wright. Um, well, I, I mean, Alexander the Great came before the New Testament. So he conquered the okay. world. Well, interesting, interesting. He did, he did. But the accounts of him come after... Scripture, after the New Testament. So what my, here's my point, is it plays to our favor. I'm not uh, disagreeing there. It plays to our favor because w when you look at time scales, right, of, of ancient records and the people they portray, Alexander's sources like uh, Plutarch and Suetonius, are hundreds of years removed from the occurrences, from the events of his life. But we don't have, we don't have any problem with that, right? We watch History Channel. They do the history. We, we accept it, right? And then what happens is... Yeah, hold on. Hold on. You're going to agree with me in just a second, if you listen. Uh, so Jesus' life, right? So, so who talks about Alexander? People who we're in the right place to say something about witnessing what happened, right? Same thing is in effect in Scripture. But in Scripture, the earliest, 1 Corinthians 15, the creed that Paul includes, is only, the source material of that is only years away from the events rather than hundreds of years. But what happens is people are so skeptical of anything that has any miracles in it that they sort of throw it out. Yet, if you read the opening of the uh, History of Alexander, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the title. I think it's Plutarch talking about Alexander. What happens right at the beginning of the book? Alexander, born of a virgin and of a, go of a Greek god. So it's a double standard. That's sort of a side point, but... The, point, the, 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 the important point is that we're going to use that same historical criteria that they use to determine other antiquities and, and their credibility for certain accounts, right? So say they read through Alexander the Great, and they say, okay, we'll set aside the virgin birth, but we do think that this happened, and we'll set aside this sort of weird Greek god thing, but we'll say that this did happen. If you do those same criteria, we're going to end up with certain minimal facts I'm not saying that those are the only ones we can accept. There's a whole load of things as Christians that we believe in there's a case to be made for. But as a method, as a way of approaching people who aren't there yet, that's our Trojan horse, as it were, because we're doing genuine history. We come up with some minimal facts based on that same criteria that you would use for any of these other historical facts that everybody accepts. If you use that same methodology, you end up with certain core facts from the gospel accounts that that Christian, all the way from um, really conservative evangelicals to the most skeptical, true biblical scholars will accept. So uh, we'll talk about that criteria. And what, that's what we're doing. We're focusing in on the, the minimal facts. We're narrowing down out of all the potential things that, that, have, uh, that, that are reliable 
to some certain minimal facts that are indisputable amongst the scholars. Then we move over to the other side, and we, <coughs> having got our, sifted through our raw data down to the minimal facts, we're going to first go through the resurrection itself as a, as a hypothesis, right? Because we're like investigators. We're saying, okay, let's do the historical investigation and see how the resurrection fares based on these facts and the criteria. And then we'll, there's a whole slew of um, non-resurrection hypotheses. <laughs> like, for instance, um, the swoon theory. Have you ever heard of the swoon theory? Like, oh, Jesus didn't really die. He actually just sort of fainted on the cross. And then, you know, the nice, damp, cool air, he sort of revived in the tomb and then rolled the stone away and got past the 10 guards. I don't know how he did that, but that's the theory, right? So we start weighing the actual resurrection, physical resurrection, versus some of these other theories based on Again, we're, we're not doing any inerrancy. We're not doing any theology here. All we're doing is straight up history. And what we end up with is something that is hard for people to overcome when they argue against it. So what you're saying is, this theory is almost like the same thing. It's talking outside the Bible. Yeah. So the same way, there are a number of things in apologetics like that. So for instance, um, when I mentioned earlier, all things that begin to exist have a cause. That little argument made no theological references, made no biblical references, no Jesus references. It's just pure engagement with reality and what are the facts. And any time you do that, ultimately it's going to lead back to the spiritual reality if, if you follow it. I think I walked out of the frame again. So ultimately... The conclusion of this, this method is to, to show the explanatory superiority of resurrec the resurrection hypothesis. So that's just a fancy way of saying the resurrection is a better explanation than anything else that's out there. So I said it's an inference to the best explanation. So there's a number of ways. I probably won't get too deep into this. But um, if you start studying logic, philosophy, there's going to be a number of different ways that arguments are laid out. Uh, there's the, the inference to the best, uh, sorry, best explanation is an abductive argument as opposed to deductive or inductive. And I won't get into that too deeply, but I'll just say that if you read this line, the abductive, certain facts are best explained by a certain conclusion. So um, sometimes people like to think of this like Sherlock Holmes, right? He walks in and or actually, uh, let's see if I have, this is from J. Warren Wallace's book. You know, if you're Sherlock Holmes and you walk in and you, you see this scene, you're going to start putting two and two together and seeing you don't know everything, but you know enough circumstantially to say what's the best way of explaining this. So you you list all the possibilities that are reputable or, or that are reasonable or plausible, and then you start sifting through the evidence and you come down to, in this instance, you got a dead man lying face down, pool of blood, knife in the back, multiple stab wounds. You have reasons to, to cross out natural death. <laughs> I mean, it still is logically possible that he died naturally, right? But it doesn't seem to make very much sense that he had a heart attack and then somebody came in and stabbed him. Uh, and it wasn't an accidental death because the knife's not in his front. It's in his back. Same thing with suicide, right? It's pretty hard to stab yourself in the back and do it multiple times before you fall down. Maybe he was already laying down when he stabbed himself the extra times. I don't know. But point being is it's not, it's not absolutely certain, but it's utterly reasonable to deny these other options for homicide, right? So that's what abductive reasoning is. It's like Sherlock Holmes. It's like a detective. It's like a historian. Uh, let me cancel that.
Okay, now a couple of the points, because some people will throw out things like, I was just saying, well, it's still possible, you know. Maybe he tripped on something and did a flip, and the knife was in the air, and then as he landed, it hit him in the back, bounced off a bone, and flipped in the air again and kept stabbing him. I mean, you can't deny it's utterly possible, but... Uh, where that's not what we're talking about. Possibilities are cheap. I could say it's possible that uh, the first part of this class never happened and we all just appeared to exist five minutes ago. You cannot give me a proof that that, there's no way to prove to me that's not the case. I can always come up with a reason why there's a possibility against that. Possibilities are so cheap. Yeah, but how do I know that's, I mean, it could, I can come up, I, just get, give me long enough and I'll come up with some crazy story, right? I could say, well, that's, uh, we're all part of a dream, you know, and that doesn't actually exist. We're just part of a dream or something like that. You're right, though. We could look at the video and we probably will. And then when, when it's not there, then you'll believe it. So we're dealing with the reasonable, not Reasonable, plausible, probable, not the possible. Now, we do have to, the resurrection itself does have to be possible, so we have to have a worldview that accommodates that. In fact, if there's anything that's a difficulty, it's what I was saying about miracles. Uh, anybody's going to have a problem with miracles that doesn't already believe in the supernatural. So that's probably the biggest stumbling block for them. But it's easy to see, based on those arguments for God's existence, that you would have a scenario in which you have a creator, and then his interaction with his creation. So, so the question is, what is the most reasonable explanation? And J. Warner Wallace puts it this way, evidentially unsupported speculations, well, that's his phrase, but I wrote the sentence, evidentially unsupported speculations do not refute the most reasonable explanation. Right? And let's just talk real quick about knowledge and certainty. So, okay, this is one of those questions that I had talked about going off to study philosophy that changed in my mind. Because if you had asked me before I, and somebody said, do you know, I would have equated that with, are you certain? But those are two different things. See, broadly, they're synonyms, but they're actually different concepts. Okay, so if you demand certainty, if you start talking to skeptics, you're going to run into somebody that's going to demand certainty from you if you don't, if you haven't already. So remember, it's knowledge is justified true belief. So you can have that without being certain. In fact, if you start to list the things that you're certain about, and that's the only thing that you would allow yourself to claim to know, you're going to run out of things you know really fast. <laughs> and anytime anybody makes a claim to you, you're going to deny it based on that skepticism. So the problem with that sort of demand for certainty, it's, it's called Cartesian skepticism, is it, 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 it demands too much, and if it's true, it, proves, it, it takes away too much. It would take away almost all knowledge. You can think of it in terms of like a court case, right? Has any, have you guys been on a trial jury before? Where, yeah, I, it's just a reasonable doubt. And last time I was on a trial jury, well, I guess it was the one time, um, the, uh, there were two holdouts. We ended up being a hung jury because no matter how many times I tried to rephrase the whole concept of reasonable doubt, they were still looking for certainty. And they would, <laughs> I, I even, there was a whiteboard in the room and I started diagramming logic and uh, they, they had that same impasse. It was like certainty or nothing. Certainty equals knowledge. Well, that's not true. So what we want is proof beyond a reasonable doubt on any of these points. Okay. What time are we at? Is it time to call it? Okay. So let me just uh, read this and we'll be done. So this is from Habermas. The minimal facts approach considers only data that meet two criteria. One, the, daddy, the, da <laughs> the data are strongly evidenced. Okay. That seems basic, right? You've got to have good evidence. And two, the data are granted by virtually all scholars on the subject, even the skeptical ones. 
So like I was saying, from the most conservative to the most liberal scholar is going to accept what we're going to include in our minimal facts. That's not saying it's true just because scholars believe it, but it's saying there must be something about it if it's pretty much universally accepted. And then we look at why it's accepted, and then we decide that it holds water because of those reasons. And I'll finish by reading this. A skeptic ought not to be allowed to merely cite apparent contradictions in the Bible and say that the resurrection has been disproved. Again, that's, that would be like trying to show inerrancy and then show the specific facts. The minimal facts approach builds a case using facts with a high degree of certainty, facts that any skeptic probably accepts. These facts need to be addressed. If a skeptic takes a position that even the majority of skeptical scholars reject, we can argue individually for the minimal facts that we are using. So, if a skeptic prefers to take another position, that's okay. In doing so, the believer now has an opportunity to present much more data in support of the argument for Jesus' resurrection. The skeptic will need to respond. So that's our method, and first thing next time, uh, we'll probably get right into the, the meat of it. I'll throw out the red meat right away next time. So thank you guys, and if you have any questions, come and talk to me, and I'll see you next time.